We call the uh, meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Let's see, anybody coming off mute? Next up is approval of the agenda. I motion to approve the agenda. Nice second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consider approving prior meeting minutes. For once, I have no amendments to the results. <laughs> I, I move that we approve the minutes. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up is business conversations with invited entities. We have two here in the room. And Elaine from the hospital school. I guess we do have Kristen from Clara Martin. And that was the one I didn't get to. I got to, to these two on late last week. I think it was even Friday. So thank you for your flexibility. We've had a few different things going on. So I think we do have all three of the original set that you had talked about. I wanted to get you rolling at least with a couple. Um, so this was the conversation you want to have. It was sort of a broad conversation. It can be as detailed as you want about current needs, prospective needs, um, if there are opportunities for improvement in terms of how we work better together, or the things we do well. Just to have that general conversation with what are probably three of the um, more prominent users um, from last time. And I'll work on the tech issues maybe while you get going. Some of what we want to understand though are the needs, but then what are the needs that you think the town ought to be providing as part of the police force versus what are the other needs that you have that you would put under the overall umbrella of safety and security and um, whatnot that maybe law enforcement isn't needed for that we can make a list of because there's some thoughts on other ways to meet different needs out there that are not necessarily a town law enforcement entity type need to meet, if that makes sense. All right. Anybody uh, want to jump up and down and be first? Oh, Dan smiled first. Dan Dan looks anxious to get home to dinner. <laughs> No, if, if you're ready to have that. Yeah, no, actually, it's probably better off because it's, it's 6 o'clock. I've been up since about 4.30, so now you need to sit down. Um, <laughs> my energy's going to gonna fall out a little bit. So I, I kind of split it up into kind of there's there's needs and nice cities. Um, Could you introduce yourself, oh, please? sorry about that. Lane Millington, uh, Superintendent of Schools, Orange Southwest School District. Thank you. Um, the, the needs that we have, um, they're not... I won't call them frequent, but they are vitally important when in, when they do occur. You know, if we get threats, if students are uttering threats within the school, um, it's nice to have the police force there. We have a threat assessment protocol um, that we as a district run. Um, we also try to do that in tandem, especially for the ones that seem more serious, have the police come in and kind of run their own as well so that we can compare notes. Um, we need them available occasionally in this age of trauma-based behaviors um, to control and contain. Um, if we have a student that's out of control, um, can't get themselves kind of settled back down again, you know, we will call the, the police force to come in and help them assist us with that. Again, these are rare events, uh, but they do occur. So that's why I put them in that needs category. You know, we would be in dire straits if we did not have those services. Um, there's also the nice city category, um, and that's, it's nice to have the community policing, um, have the police in and around the building, just checking in with kids and families, um, getting to know folks a little bit, building trust, um, sharing knowledge um, about what's happening, um, both with the students and, and with the families so that if they're in need in any way, we can help and coordinate and provide wraparound services um, to those families. Uh, also, if we have kind of minor infractions that are a little bit above you know, what should be happening in a school, but not really at the criminal level, it's nice to be able to connect with the police force for diversion. Right? Now, we don't want to get the kids in trouble, but we want to treat it seriously enough that the students get the message that, yeah, this is a big deal. Um, and then, you know, uh, combined training um, is a nicety as well. So when we're practicing our lockdown drills, uh, anything that we're doing to keep the, the district safe and prepared. Uh, so kind of as a, a general summary. 
Lane, when you say uh, the threats are rare, do you have any, do you keep statistics or data? Uh, so the student threats um, are interesting. I would say in my six years since we've been here, just off the cuff, ones that were concerning, uh, reached that concerning level, there were probably about three. Um, in terms of having the police come in and assist with threat assessments, you know, there's probably been 12 or 15, uh, but those are for, you always run through the protocols, you know, we have, we'll have students that will come in, they picked up the coat for the first time since last hunting season, you know, they'll get to school and realize they've got a cartridge in there. You know, we still run a threat assessment just to be sure, but that's what I would call um, kind of low key. The other thing that typically happens is that when there is a shooting somewhere in the world, um, in another school district, you know, across the country, the students will come in and there'll be a lot of chatter about it. And so while they're just processing and while they're talking, other students might hear, you know, what they're saying and think there's a threat being made when there's not. But again, there's still things that we need to check out. But in six years, can you, do you think that there's been three times where you needed to involve the police in the threats? Three times where it was <clears throat> imminently critical that they were involved, um, given the information that we had. Um, I could probably say there were another four or five times that were turned out to be perfectly fine, but it was really nice to have the extra bodies, extra eyes, the extra threat assessment capabilities. And are you aware at all of um, times when the principals have used, principals at the high school have used the police to go check on a student who may be um, that, that would there. be a part of wraparound services that I call them, so the safety checks, yeah. Yeah, that has, is that part of the niceties? Is that um, to me? That's a whole different category. <clears throat> Rapper, if you talk, talk those are checks. again. It's kind of the community portion. You know, we're hearing things. It's not really a school thing, but we want to make sure that, that parents and family and, and, and friends are safe. And you need the police to do that. There's nobody else in the school. Uh, state state police will not do that. Um, we have sought a grant for what's called out, an outreach <clears throat> worker um, who could semi-perform that function. And um, where do you fall on the idea about an SRO in the school? I have been very pro about it since my first year here. Um, I've never done a, a community-wide survey to get the feel for the entire community, but I can tell you the, the two or three times that I brought it up as a focus for a, an open forum, you know, I'll get 30 to 50 people there that are dramatically against. Um, hmm. And so, but again, that's a small representative body mm -hmm. um, and so usually the conversations don't go much further um, but again that community pe uh, community piece um, the SROs are fantastic um, I've worked in two districts where I worked very closely uh, with SROs and it was one of the best relationships ever um, got to know the kids they actually worked uh, taught a little bit they work in our health programs um, especially in the drug and the alcohol part of the curriculum um, with the students. Um, is, there, is there money in your budget to support um, uh, funding towards an SRO? It would be an additional ask, um, but the community has been very generous um, with the school districts in the last couple of years. Despite um, this group of people who you said are against the idea, okay. Yeah. So, so it, it's possible. Um, it would take a bit of investigation and vetting with, with a broader portion of the community mm -hmm. um, to see where they are. And then, you know, it's where, where the school board stands. I've actually <laughs> talked with them twice in the last two months about it. Um, there are two or three that are very supportive. Um, the others aren't, don't seem for or against. They're just kind of neutral on it. Um, but again, it hasn't been any kind of like high pressure talks about <coughs> it. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a thought? Of, do you have a I'm Joe Bosey. Um, do, do you have a thought of what it would cost for an SRO? Uh, typically, uh, what happens is we contract it out from local police, contract the, the person out from local police. Um, I'm not sure what police salaries are. I mean, Scott might be able to, to say that, but it would be the cost of uh, the actual salary. My guess is probably in the $60,000 range. And then um, with our benefits package, our benefits package is without another 40000 to it. The town used to have one a number of years ago. Yeah. You know, and and uh, it served quite well, served quite well, but that's the point that, you know, the federal grant, if you will, a COPS grant, ran out mm -hmm. and, and the school didn't support putting it 
onto, onto their budget. Yeah, no, a long, long time ago, before my time. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I was, have heard, was. yeah, I've had some discussions yeah, with folks about yeah, that. Uh, yeah, she, she did it, she did it. So I was sorry to see her go because she did other policing work in yeah. the town when she wasn't in, when, when she was in interactive roles, the SRO. Yeah. Yeah, so and in our, our case, if we had one, they would be primarily housed at the high school, but they would serve the entire district. Notice, notice in, the, in the town reports and in in, in the reports put out by the school, and, and voting on it as, as well, it seems to be that each year there's you know hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in, in, in surpluses. Is there any way that that can be diverted enough to pay for that <laughs> SRO? Say, say it costs you know, sixty thousand in salary and. You know, thirty thousand benefits. We all know. You know, we all know what it costs. So, you know, you're gonna spend that year a hundred thousand dollars on that. Is that is, is that money available to be used in that way? Uh, not unless the town votes for it to be used in that way. So what happens is if we have a surplus at the end of the year, which we typically do, um, a lot of it is due to the the ESSER grants, which are drying up this year, um, a, the American Recovery Act grants. Um, when we have a surplus at the end of the year on March 7th, um, we can do a couple of things with, with, the, uh, with the money. Usually we roll a good chunk of it over to pay, you know, kind of offset taxes for the coming school year. Um, on the March vote, uh, the town can vote to target some of that money for specific purposes. Like we have a facilities reserve fund, so often we'll have them put some money in the facilities reserve fund, but it is targeted for specific facilities work. Um, I did create during uh, COVID an operational reserve fund, uh, which is kind of more fluid just to keep the school operating. So we could potentially, with the surplus, you know, put money into the reserve fund to fund that. For the, the not, yeah. not that it would pass. I'm, I'm pro S. I don't know, yeah. you know, but not, not that it would pass. Or it would Nice to see the voters you get that. To yeah, get that and, and off, yeah, like I said, I'm not. I'm certainly not opposed. I'm, I'm very pro on so. so I think it would help out Scott a lot with his other other duties. You'd have someone right there on site, and maybe could visit all of the schools as those needs are, because it's a much larger district than it used to be back then, too. So. Well, the the other thing is that if the district is paying for the SRO. Um, we can use it in the other two towns, right? right? right. The tax money that we have comes in not just from the state, but it comes in from the two towns. It's all yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good questions. Do you have a sense of um, how your teaching staff feels about having an SRO? Uh, in the past, um, the union, not necessarily the union body, but some of the union leaders have said they are against. A lot of it, the, the comments I get is, you know, we don't we don't need a, a firearm in the schools. Yeah. What would their alternative be, though? Basically, what you said, if they don't want that, uh, for the support. Clarify the question for me. Well, I mean, like, if they don't want an SRO, um, but but what else would there be to get the support they need, except from the local police? What would your, what, what other there, there wouldn't thing? be. There wouldn't be like, like I said, the, the one thing that we have uh, had done, um, now that I've got a person who's kind of dedicated to grants, is we're trying to get, get an outreach worker, but that's more for wrap-up yeah. services, right? Things that we recognize that there's something going on in the family that's affecting the student's life. We work with the student, but an outreach worker can actually go into the home after hours, work with the family, work with the student, um, and try to also connect with the state services. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so we've been working on that. You said you're trying to get one? Like, is the issue, do you have the funding for it, but you can't We're find the people? We're in the middle of the grant process for it. Um, if oh. we get it, it might be something, you know, it was a significant amount of money. I don't remember the exact dollar figure, but I think we could actually get two. Um, and then that would be something that when the grant funding came up, I might come to the town and say, hey, they've been doing really good work. It actually might reduce some of the policing workload if they're doing a, a good job. Um, Kind of so we're looking down the road, like 2025, 20, maybe? Uh, I hope the next school year. Yeah. Next school year. So not, not the current one we're in. Yeah, next. okay. <clears throat> Just for folks both in the room and online, we've had a request. If I have a soft voice, I'm trying to project. So if everyone else can, it helps that capture better. <clears throat> and, and for folks in the room and online, and to the extent <clears throat> we can use our theater voices, use our outside voices inside, I guess. Trevor, you need to go. You need to go wireless, Mister. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get you all that little hell mics for next time? So. 
<laughs> thanks. Thanks. Sorry about that. Do you have any more questions for Lynn? I don't see any. If anything comes um, up later, email. I'm happy to, to come and attend these meetings as folks need me. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. All right. We'll move on to Dan, right. who avoided well, the seat. first place yeah. hot seat. <laughs> Dan Bennett, I'm the CEO of Gifford. Um, so I'll go to the format that Trini asked about, word of the law enforcement and then the other sort of quasi-law uh, enforcement or, <coughs> or community support. Remind me of this, become by soft voice, too. Um, so I think the most high profile in terms of law enforcement is when we do have acts of violence at the hospital. Typically, um, uh, that would be in the emergency department. Uh, at times, it could be in other settings, such as the inpatient unit, or um, it could be in one of our practices. But typically, uh, that would be something that would occur in the emergency department, and um, we would put out a call to law enforcement. That occurs about 10 times a year. Um, so again, I'd say that's, that's more the, um, the strict law enforcement um, component of it. Um, we have a number of other things that local law enforcement supports us with. Uh, Orange County, when they had the contract, and now um, the local um, PD. Um, the, the biggest one, or the most frequent, is uh, we have a drug take-back kiosk that we have in the main lobby at the hospital, um, which uh, historically had been down at the police department. It came up to Gifford in 2018, 2019, maybe. Um, uh, and the reason being that um, I think we get grant funding to get the actual box, um, but uh, also secondary to that was that it wasn't highly utilized down at the police department and the thought was there would be more heavily utilized at the hospital uh, and that has been the case. It's about 20 to 25 times a year uh, that needs to be empty and that is done uh, with one of our pharmacist from, a, from the hospital, there's two keys, uh, one of our pharmacists and then uh, a law enforcement officer empty that uh, and take it to be disposed. Um, I, I apologize, I meant to look at the contract to um, see the specific language in it. I looked at it a couple of years ago and I believe the, um, uh, it, it's best practice that it be done in the fashion we're doing it, having a pharmacist and a law enforcement uh, officer do that. Uh, I would say from our perspective, we wouldn't do it unless we had a law enforcement officer involved just because of the safety, because of the issues with handling uh, discarded drugs. Sometimes there's needles in there, that sort of thing. Um, so that's about 20, it was uh, 20, uh, 20 times last year. Uh, at this point, this year, beginning of September, we're already at 18, so it would probably be 20 to 22 this year times that that would need to be um, emptied. I'll just say for the, because um, it's a, a good number, there's over 500 pounds of uh, disposed of uh, drugs that uh, were taken away last year uh, by law enforcement from those um, uh, boxes. So it's a significant community benefit to do that, and we do it in partnership. Dan, can, sorry, can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. Um, so Scott, when you give us the data on the involvements or if there's an, uh, like if Gifford's address comes up as uh, you're responding to, does that include this 20 to 25 times a year? Yes. <clears throat> Where you're there to empty the prescription thing? Yes. So, so you actually, uh, so is there any way to tease, that we don't have a way to tease that out because it just shows up as an address with uh, how many times you're there for an, an emergency or like a? Or it might be labeled differently. It would be labeled differently. Okay. Because the majority of the ones that we do for, like, say, the drug take back or Vigilanco or different lap smile or things like that would be an agency assist. Um, okay. And if it was something else, a threat, an act of violence, it would be labeled as. And is, is this thing a time consuming thing, what Dan's talking about? Well, it takes us maybe 10 minutes. Oh, okay. All right. 
That key's not that hard in there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> depends on who the farm, if the pharmacist is chatting away that day. Depends on the chat too. Okay. That goes both ways. All right. Sorry, Dan. Thank but you. But that also is something that um, you know it's not it's not an emergent. So if if it's full and we call and they're not available, we can wait. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we we end up having it so it's not accessible for a small period of time. But typically, uh, you know. We can get it emptied pretty quick. Um, Scott mentioned Benji Van Gogh. That's the drive-through um, free food um, collaboration that we do with Vermont Food Bank. Uh, that's once um, once a month, so 12 times a year. Um, we have been using uh, law enforcement to help with the um, traffic control on that. And if any of you have been through there, people line up anywhere from a half hour to an hour early on Route 12, stretching back towards Shaw's. So uh, that is helpful. Again, it's not a hard law enforcement activity, but it is helpful to that. We did, uh, Gifford, we did talk with Vermont Food Bank to uh, find out, um, because officially it's, it's their event. Um, we did talk with them about whether they felt it was necessary to have that traffic control, they did want it, uh, and I believe that um, uh, they're now, we're, we're, um, Randolph PD is now billing them uh, for that uh, time that they spend on that traffic control. Same thing with event support. Um, uh, uh, Scott mentioned the last mile ride. Uh, that's basically, I mean, it's thought of as one event, but there was uh, three, uh, three different events uh, that occurred with that, um, and um, uh, Randolph PD is billing us for the time uh, for that as well. Um, there's a lot of uh, phone contact as well and regular communication. Uh, we will know sometimes that we have somebody coming in for an appointment who has had some challenges or made some threats in the past um, and will let, um, uh, you know, I, I just say you know, to answer one of the other questions, communication. Uh, is excellent. Collaboration is excellent. Uh, we enjoy the relationship. Um, when uh, you had the contract with Orange County and now uh, with the current um, Randolph PD as well. Um, so we do some coordination there. Typically though, that does not result in, a, um, uh, in an on-site uh, visit unless something goes wrong. Um, I would just also note that we have uh, supplemented um, uh, at Gifford, uh, we've had, uh, I've been there for seven years, so uh, at least for six years we've had um, a, a contract for uh, in-house security that is there after hours during the week, so starting at 6 o'clock at night, uh, going overnight until 6 a.m., and then on the weekend, 24 hours, and then they cover uh, uh, our uh, recognized holidays as well. So we are paying for that service uh, secondary. They do not carry, they're not uh, law officers, they're private security, so they don't carry weapons, they don't have tasers, anything like that. Uh, but that has been um, really helpful in uh, having them present in situations where there is uh, some sort of escalation and uh, they are trained in de-escalation techniques and um, support our staff and are considered part of our team uh, when, they're, um, when they're on the job. So that has been very helpful as well. And I do think that that, over the years, has helped reduce the, um, the need to call in law enforcement for specific events um, as well. So that's, I think, the answer that I had to the specific questions. I'm happy to take any other questions. I, I, don't, I just have an observation. If I can, uh, listening to both of you in what services the police provide for you, it's extensive. And I don't think the public generally even knows about it or understands it. The only thing we know about the police is that they might be stopping us coming up and down Main Street. But they obviously are doing an awful lot that the public doesn't really know. That's, that's my observation. As I noted, the relationship is really good, a lot of communication, and um, you know, the, um, the number of actual law enforcement calls are, are not a lot, but the communication and the 
collaboration uh, is extensive, and uh, you know, but to to um, Trini's comments before, it's not a, the vast majority of it is not what you would consider to be hard law enforcement type activities. Dan, in those ten times a year you said roughly for the violence in the ED. Um, do either of you have any idea of the average length of time that takes? It could be anything. <laughs> Whether it's a assault piece, it's a out of control mental health patient that may take you know ten minutes, it may take two hours. Uh, we've been there for hours on end a couple times. Um, it all depends on the circumstances of why we got called up there in the first place. So it's hard to put an average on it. Yeah, we don't, and, and we don't track the, the time frame. I did ask you know, people that question, and they said the same thing. It really just varies situation by situation. Okay. The other time piece that's associated with that, um, which Dan had mentioned, is the communication. So after you do have an event like that, there are probably hours with the communication sure, sure. Uh, as right. follow-up. Right. Right. Um, and, and Scott, do you, do you ever sit with patients, who, men, men, uh, in particular mental health patients, who are waiting for to get transport to some other hospital? No, uh, you know, because of, you know, even with the sheriff's office, because of being short-staffed or whatever, it's, you know, can we get the patient de-escalated enough where the ER staff feels comfortable with law enforcement being absent out of that way? Mm -hmm. um, that's usually when we will take place, but we don't sit on those patients from the clock. And you don't have people, I'm not talking about this security on the weekends, you don't have uh, in-house people who would sit with patients, or do you? We do, yeah. Um, again, depending on uh, if somebody is uh, on an, in, an involuntary a hold uh, for mental health reasons, uh, we would have one-on-one -on -one, uh, with one of our staff. Uh, that could be the security um, agent. There have been a uh, security officer. There have been instances where we've worked, not so much recently because of uh, just workforce issues, but where we have been able to communicate with the um, with our uh, contracted security, and they have brought an extra security officer in who can sit as well. Uh, but we might have an LNA. We actually, in some instances, will have a nurse that's sitting uh, you know, outside that room uh, for a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, typically, it's not law enforcement, unless somebody is in custody of law enforcement. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that might not be the local PD. That could be the state. Well, and you have a bunch of rules around law enforcement using restraint in your hospital anyway, right? right? I mean, CMS would get a little upset. Yeah, it's, yeah. and uh, that's been, um, again, I'm losing track of time a little bit, but in the last two, three, four years, that's been, uh, the rules have changed, or the way that the rules have been interpreted have changed, and that's changed the response as well. So uh, we are not, um, you know, we're, we're not allowed to have right. uh, the same type of law enforcement response that you would have previously. Right. The, the change in the rules has been away from using law enforcement. Right, yeah. exactly. Okay. Any issues with staffing um, the security team? Not currently. Okay. Not currently. We have in the past. So there, um, there's somebody there when they're supposed to be, for the most part? For the most part. We switched companies, um, I want to say a year ago, and uh, the new company has had more of a consistent staffing than the previous company did. The previous company did a really good job. Uh, but they ran into situations where they were having trouble filling those uh, slots. Uh, when we brought the new company in, they actually hired one or two of the previous people from the other company, so we had some continuity there. Um, those guys have done, in, in, uh, uh, men and ladies have done some uh, real nice work with us, and uh, that, that has been a, um, a good relationship. You've probably interacted with them as well, Scott. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you explain if you have any needs up at Morgan Orchards, because that's, you know, it's another property that you have that's within the town, maybe not in the district. Yeah, that was in my notes. Thank you for hearing me up on that. Um, so we, we've had a few events recently, um, primarily since the, uh, the recent situation with the Sheriff's Department and them not being able to provide as much coverage countywide. We've had a number of suspicious, um, what we, I would say suspicious activity on the grounds of uh, Morgan Orchards where we've called uh, and it's been after hours, uh, nighttime typically or the weekend. 
Uh, so we've gone through to the state police and it's taken anywhere from an hour to several hours for them to respond, which at that point, uh, whatever suspicious activity was going on um, has um, dissipated. Uh, but there's been a couple of situations where we've had, um, again, suspicious individuals who've tried to gain access to, um, I believe, once at the nursing home and once at the independent living. Uh, they were not able to gain access because we have, um, you know, because, because of our um, locked, right. locked facility. Um, but that's been that's been pretty scary for people, and uh, you know there hasn't been uh, the state police don't have the resources either. So that's that's been a um, that's been an issue. So do you again, it's maybe it's it's you know it's it's on one hand that I can count, but still. The uh, facility's not that old, right? right yeah, right, 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 right. And, I, and I'm and I'm talking yeah. about since the um, you know since the end of January when the Orange County stopped providing. The mm. coverage that they used to. Mm. Interesting. So, um, not to get into your security system, do you camera the property and, or have some kind of secret that would like Hunter North or whoever the, I think you, may, you, know, you mentioned at a newer company, would they respond from the hospital and come up? No, so it's, it, it was Hunter North, now it's Sensor. Um, they are strictly at the hospital, so they're not there. We do, we do employ, um, you know, we, we have a number of uh, safety measures we have in place, in, in, including cameras, um, but uh, you know it, it's also a, a large property with a lot of outside open space, and you can't cover it all. Um, it only records the event; it doesn't do anything really to, to yeah. stop the event. Yeah, yeah. 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 so I'm, um, I don't want to get into too much depth about the security right. measures on, right. Right. Uh, yeah. you know, on, on camera, on myself on camera here, but right. But, right. but yes, we do have, we do have security measures. Great, great, thank you. We do training for the vast majority of our front-facing staff as well. Um, we've done um, CSI, is it not CSI? Uh, it's crisis. We we did uh, crisis de-escalation training. We did for a, a large number of employees over the last several years, and then we started going to doing Moab um, training. Um, and Moab stands for um, Management of Aggressive Behavior. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, so we so we do that training again. It's not all 600 people that work at Gifford, but um, we try to get that out to anybody who's in a front-facing position, so that they have some tools in their tool belt as well. Thank you. Nice. Any more questions of Dan? I actually have a question for me, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> he didn't use all his time. He did not use all his time. Dan oh. has used all his time. But Dan is <laughs> fair game. Well, uh, Dan made me think of uh, special events. Like, what about the district and special events? Yeah, we do. We usually, you know, they should be paying for the duties. Um, I know Scott has offered, and we had some security issues last year, kind of relative to the cultural clashes that were going on um, that were showing up and providing support just to make sure the folks mm -hmm. were safe. Oh, about like traffic control. Like I know, like the fifth and sixth grade five K. Scott was present in graduation, or like that uh, necessity versus nicety. Th those were would be like community policing. It's, it's awesome to happen there, okay. um, but it, it wouldn't fall under like a necessity. Um, if we're calling for a duty, like a, you know, if we've had threats from out of state, like we had last year, you know, that that's a that's a necessity. You know, we're, we're gonna have. Uh, but typically, we do the, the, the duty fees that we offer to, and, and sometimes he doesn't accept. <laughs> yeah, what about having? Yeah, I know you have a presence, uh, used to anyway, of officers at basketball games. Uh, Boys, been home. A little, yeah. Games. You're dating yourself. Yeah. Am I? I remember yeah. it too. <laughs> yeah. Didn't I used to get a ride home with you last year? <laughs> so that hasn't happened. Right? <laughs> that hasn't in the happened front seat in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember sometimes. Are we still on camera? <laughs> it's been about a year. It's only been a year. Okay, so that's that's not a thing anymore. So, uh, due to the staffing issues that we had with the sheriff's office, we weren't able to come. We tried to pinpoint, like, um, 
you know, major games, uh, games that have major rivalries, you know, to try to get an officer there. Williamstown, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, <laughs> they, you know, they, then we kind of worked into uh, the night officer swinging in, double checking. I see. And then, you know, it's just in a, and then currently where we are, I don't have the staff. Yeah, okay. To be able to, okay. Be able to do that. Okay. And Lane, can I just yeah. piggyback on that? <laughs> Speaking of Moab training, do, do you guys get ALICE training or de-escalation training as well, right? Yeah. Um, we just actually, we can completed a, across the district and we're getting geared up to redo all the kids again. Uh, especially after last year with the security concerns. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't keep your staff from calling the police if they need to. I mean, that's just no. That matter of fact, you know, they're they're encouraged, especially if they they believe there's an emergency situation. Yeah. It's not normal. Okay. Yeah. That's your first. That's your first duty. Mm -hmm. Get yourself safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sorting it out. Great. We ready to move on to Claire Martin? <coughs> Great. I believe we have Kristen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Briggs. I'm the program director of access and acute care at Claire Martin Center. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Yes. I'm, I'm, uh, I apologize. I know that my screen without my video is the one popping up on the large piece, and I'm up in the corner, but. I was having trouble with my computer audio today, so I didn't want to risk it for this meeting. Uh, so I'm on my audio phone here. <clears throat> so I guess following the same uh, the same structure that that Dan um, just used and was used before, I I think um, for the most part at Clara Martin Center, when we're reaching out to law enforcement, it really is a consultation. Um, or when they're reaching out to us, there's a uh, consultation in both directions uh, on a situation, uh, wondering if the involvement from the other entity is something that makes sense, uh, really discussing the lens of why, you know, if we're reaching out, we might say uh, that we are thinking about going out to a home. We've heard there's a serious risk of harm to self or others. Um, we either don't know or do know that there's weapons uh, present and depending on what the threats have been, we call to consult with law enforcement to see if that's something that that would be a possible joint response um, for scene safety. Uh, and the other direction, you know, it might be that uh, law enforcement is reaching out because they have had some kind of uh, connection with a person that they believe to be known to Claire Martin Center and they wanna see if there's an existing relationship that might support in the situation. Uh, they might be trying to help divert uh, criminal charges or something like that if they know that the presenting issue is really around mental health concerns. Uh, and, and of course, with confidentiality laws, you know, we may or may not be able to, um, to support in the different ways um, that, that might be sought out, but it's, it's that collaboration. I think Dan was speaking to this. Um, just a moment ago, the, the collaborative relationship and keeping that open. And that's exactly what consultation is. It doesn't always result in action, but it's having the conversation around what might be possible or appropriate uh, for, for the situation. So that's the, the, the largest way that we use law enforcement is the consultation piece, um, information seeking piece. Um, and then there may or may not be uh, some kind of joint response uh, or single response following that. Um, if somebody were to come to an agency setting, just like I think any any place in the community, if somebody were to come and be uh, making threats, not willing to leave when asked, they were uh, presenting with violent behavior or something like that, of course, we would reach out to, to law enforcement. That really doesn't happen uh, very frequently at all um, and hasn't happened. Um, for multiple years at this point on site. Um, and we would also, you know, if there were ever a situation where we needed to have uh, no trespass order or something like that in place, we would um, 
we would certainly reach out to law enforcement. And then if there were, if that wasn't being followed, we would reach out. But that's also not anything that's, that's currently a situation. Sometimes um, with specific people in the community, the law enforcement might be familiar with them or we might be familiar with them and, and, and there might be very um, visible ways that they struggle in the community. So oftentimes under what's allowed with emergency response, you know, for both us and law enforcement, we'll collaborate on a, on a plan of how will we approach this situation if there's continued need and um, how can we do that together and also stick to the same plan that we make so that um, we're not creating um, uh, we're not creating a split between us. Uh, so I know um, specifically um, Scott and I have worked together in that way uh, previously. I imagine that'll continue with the local uh, police department. And um, that's really that's that's really the gist of it. We don't really have events or anything where there's uh, law enforcement presence or safety presence. You know the the other things uh, that were mentioned. Um, we, we do sometimes have different um, efforts where, uh, you know, we're trying to put on some kind of community event, not necessarily as the host, but a bunch of uh, partners or uh, citizens from the area trying to put something on in the community, then there might be involvement and collaboration there, but it's, it's really around that community presence um, and not something that's specifically being directed that needs to happen. So, you know, we did some uh, community events uh, where we showed uh, the Ernie and Joe film, for example. And um, I know that there was a uh, presence from law enforcement there as, as a way of supporting um, and education to the community. Um, and then, you know, again, I just want to go back to the community response. If, if we're going to someone's house or thinking about um, responding to someone's house and it's really going to be an unsafe uh, situation. We don't have, of course, we don't uh, carry um, tasers or firearms or anything like that, and, and we don't have vests, and we're not trained um, in the, the same way that law enforcement is in terms of community safety. Um, and so when we're, when we're going to a situation that we think is um, really likely to put staff knowingly in harm's way, we're not able to respond if we don't have that collaborative response, and even if we were to send more than one staff that doesn't do anything to make them any more qualified than than one staff for that response so we really um seek consultation with law enforcement around that most often and, and like i said it, it doesn't always result in actually uh anybody going out to the home um, oftentimes we talk about if a circumstance were to change or if we were to get more information or or something like that um then then perhaps we can make a plan of how we will respond um, as the situation evolves, but it's not it's not necessarily a rapid response that, that we're doing in the moment. So Kristen, in those situations where you feel the need for your safety or the safety of your people, that you need law enforcement, any idea, again, we're asking everybody the numbers, like how often, uh, let's say in a month, that you might call on Scott or the Randolph PD to assist? in providing that safety piece? Oh, sure. Yeah, that um, it's less than once a month. Um, I would say it's closer to a handful of times a year. Um, and that's a, that would be a high estimate. We go through pockets of time where there's more concerns, but if, if we're talking specifically about the direction of us reaching out to law enforcement, it's probably closer to about a handful of times a year and does not always result in the in-person response. It's also common for law enforcement to reach out to us about those same situations where they got a call from someone in the community, somebody at home, they're concerned about safety, they're concerned about someone. And, and so they'll consult with us and see what we might um, think is appropriate for mental health response or ask yeah. us to reach out and try to make contact by phone. So it can um, go both ways. And that, that probably, yeah, it can go both ways. So if I, so I, I speak to that specifically because I think it's about a handful of, of Claire Martin reaching out and then it's probably about the same for law enforcement though of course there's an ebb and flow sometimes for that so but on average um yeah I, I would say that it's probably between five and ten times a year total that that significant situation is, is happening where we're thinking about going out to a home with those unknowns consulting with each other what about a number 
on the amount of times that you just consult with each other, whether it's the PD calling you or you calling them. Even if it doesn't, even if it's not resulting in any type of home visit or anything. Yeah, I, I do want to say one specifying thing that I, or clarifying thing that I think would be helpful is I'm talking about the entire catchment of the Claire Martin Center, which would be Orange County and then six other towns outside of Orange County. So um, these aren't numbers that are specific to the town or even the village of Randolph. Um, okay. And uh, so I just want to, I realized I needed to definitely clarify that the number is much lower if we're talking about um, Randolph specifically. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question that you just asked? I apologize for that. Yeah, you, you had said that the majority of the contact that you have with the police department is consultations, either from your office to them or, or in reverse. Um, so just approximately how many times a week, a month, a year? Um, that really, again, ebbs and flows. Um, and I, I hesitate to put a number out there because typically how it happens is somebody, um, you know, uh, might be in a, a space where they're not doing well. And that presentation is concerning. It's getting ten attention of people around them. And so it might be something that, that law enforcement and Claire Martin Center are aware of for, for quite some time, um, you know, several, meaning several days or something before we're able to get that person to engage uh, with us. And so we'll be talking, collaborating, seeing if there's any updates um, in what's in, allowed within our lanes there. Um, you know, but that would be brief, brief conversations of just, is there any change? Is there anything else we should be planning for? Um, that can sometimes happen, you know, for, for days or weeks um, before, before we're actually responding. But those are generally like after the initial conversation, five, 10 minute calls, something like that. And again, um, in uh, both directions, I think uh, currently with, with the Randolph Police Department, I think we, you know, we have this open, communication. If I, if I need to reach out, I'll reach out to Scott directly. He knows he can reach out to me directly um, as overseeing the emergency services, but certainly um, certainly that, that amount of calls uh, has been quite low lately. Lately, meaning the last several months. I think, um, you know, prior to COVID and prior to changes with some of the use of force um, pieces, I think everybody looked at things a little bit differently than we would, I think it sounds like we all agree, think, think they're different now. Um, and where do we, what, what are our lanes? Uh, in what ways should we re be responding to different things? You know, that's something we've all paid a lot of attention to. So we really try to utilize law enforcement only when it's, when we feel it's necessary for safety. Uh, <laughs> The other thing that I just will mention quickly is we have the duty to warn piece, which we very infrequently utilize police for this because um, we don't it, we don't always need to. Uh, but if somebody made a comment that they had, uh, if they were not just made a comment, but if they were making threats that they were going to seriously harm um, or kill somebody um, or seriously damage property where there could be people present that could um, be injured or, or killed from that, we have um, a duty to, to make sure that that person, that potential victim is warned. And so uh, if we are not able to reach out and warn them directly, or if somebody makes that threat and then leaves saying that they're headed to do that then, right at that moment, um, then we would reach out to law enforcement in support of trying to keep that from happening. But that is a very rare occasion where, where we're um, needing to reach out to law enforcement. And I think we've done it uh, once in the, in the last several years where we had to reach out to law enforcement. We were significantly concerned that someone was on their way to harm another person in the community. Any questions from anybody else on Claire Martin? And I don't know, Scott, if you had anything that you wanted to add. I know I'm not sitting over there with you, <laughs> um, but I, I wasn't sure if you had anything you wanted to add to that. No, you did. You did. You summed it up perfectly. And uh, the big, uh, the big piece was the communication all the way around. 
on uh, how well we can, our offices can communicate in regards to the community's needs. Seems to be a theme amongst these community people. Scott? <laughs> <laughs> Great. I think that gives us the three entities. The only other one we wanted was BTC, right? Well, these were your first three, so then the question is, did you want to stack a few others for next time? We talked about BTC, we talked about SafeLine. I didn't know if you had a priority list of who you might want next. Anything here spurred follow-up? But I think, I mean, you're certainly welcome to stay. It's a public meeting, but I don't. Are we done with them? I mean, can they be? You're free to go. Dismiss them. <laughs> no, if you would like. You want. You're free to stay as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's just hurt my stomach growl. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, please, please feel free to reach out if you have other questions. Or Thanks, whatever. Kristen. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you all. very much for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It's like the great communicator over there. Yeah, they love him. Yes. That's all I got out of all that. Yeah. It's a love fest. <laughs> you want to go pay him? That's later. Uh, the other one we had talked about was some of the businesses that had higher demands. Shaw's. On that, the barn McDonald's combo, Rite Aid, Cumberland Farms, maybe Shaw's too, but those are the ones that it's gotten listed last. Time. I feel like everybody's going to say the same thing. You know? I know, we just love him. He comes to see All us. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. training boosts our morale, keeps us going. Yep. The VSC, that's the state police. This is VSB, yes. Are they going to house them to come to the uh, We kicked it around, but determined they would just give us the same thing they've already given. We can't do it. We can't do it. We have limited staff, multiple towns. We'll get there when we get there. How many calls like you get to the... Rather than bring in Cumberland Farms yeah. and, and, and Shaw's or whatever, how many calls do you get to those particular locations? You know, because someone's acting up or someone maybe stealing something, right? You know, from, from those businesses. There's also been issues with um, drugs in bathrooms. A lot of places too. I think it's for a couple of years ago. Away died. Over they died. Do we have any August data? Yeah, it's been posted. Yeah. Oh, it well, came out. Okay. Um, what's this one? Rinkers. Yeah, the barn. The barn. Yeah. Huh? the barn. Oh, that's the barn. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that. So I think that um, since we are I still call it rinkers. Considering okay. <laughs> um, what the district may be and how it may change, I think it would be smart to talk to um, some businesses that are currently outside the district just for their take on what their needs are and if they are being met by VSP and or if they could be met by Randolph PD. So maybe like McDonald's, the barn, BTC, and actually, you said Shaw's is outside the district, technically, mm -hmm. right? Um, that may give us some help deciding whether we need to redefine the district or not. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, good to get a perspective from East Randolph. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know, the store, that's the only yeah. business down no. there? KAD's down there. Right. Mm -hmm. There's some smaller businesses that are right. mostly like home businesses. Well, yes. Some things I heard was they were, they were worried of Casting the travel outside. distance from the present district to arriving there. To arriving there. Well, VSB could be coming out of Stockbridge to arrive there. That's going to take even longer. No, I'm just saying that that's, that's some, of, some of the concerns I heard. But I heard the same concern about the ambulance. 
The ambulance is on the way down towards Bethel. And how fast do they get to, right. to you know, up on Chelsea could, Mountain Road? Could Chelsea respond quicker? Right. Well, right. oh, that's what Brookfield did. They split theirs because right. of response time. One thing that stands out to me is like, it's like you, it's like building blocks because every, every once you start building on what Gifford needs and what the school needs and what businesses might need, and it's a lot when you put it all together as far as what service, you know, have how many people to serve those those areas. Mm. And then also, Staffing like, wise. you know, just Gifford, like everybody uses Gifford too. So it's just because of its location doesn't mean that other people aren't using that or the schools or, you know, mm. and so there is that too. Oh, you mean non-taxpayers. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. yeah, so just because the location is inside the district doesn't mean people outside of the district. But this service, this service area is wide. The service area isn't East Randolph and North Randolph and South Randolph. The service area is out through Bethel down down into Sharon, all mm -hmm. all the way up through Braintree, Roxbury, and everywhere. Because all the way to Montpelier, so people for, come a long distance right. for mm -hmm. their you childbirth know, services, still, even right, and right, sometimes right. that requires law enforcement if the baby's born addicted. Mm -hmm. So it's a wide service area. That's, that's the point that came up, as I recall, at town meeting, that people were getting up and talking about, you know, even though they lived in other parts, they lived outside of the police district, they were still considered that they were getting services from the police because they were sitting in the Chandler at, at that right, moment, right. or they were, yeah. you know, uh, driving through town or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of that turned to the, the conversation that came out of that was, should those that are outside of the police district pay the same for the service? Right. right. If they're supplementing the downtown area or their whatever, what should that look like versus, right. and that came from the, the comment of you know, Tim Angel. If they go by your house three times a day and I got to pay the same rate, they better be coming by my house three times a day out mm -hmm. at the end of Clay White Road. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't talked about patrolling either. We've only been talking about Respond to right, right, but it was that whole same. Right. Well, yeah, thing. but right, yeah. Even getting from downtown Randolph to the end of Clay White Road is a that's a haul. That's right. Yes. Scott, if if more so interest no called, would you go up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So what's yeah. not being yeah. talked about is I do drive bys through there parking lots on my way home. Okay. Because they've reached out, I don't feel safe. I'm kind of like the bridge off my car or something like that. And suspicious people are walking through the parking lots so or trying to break in. Those aren't talked about. That's on the way home. Oh, is that what's happening up there? Is, is, is vandalism to the parking lot cars? Oh. And also people trying to gain access into the buildings. Into the buildings. Oh. So is that newer than, it? I mean, they're new anyways, like you said, but is that newer like recently more, mm -hmm. more so than it was like a year ago? Mm -hmm. I mean, and a year ago, I mean, you had, you know, with the sheriff's office, you had oh, yeah. dedicated Shots. patrols up that way. Oh. Um, you don't have any patrols up there anymore. Yeah. But well, you have that police services fund. So do, you, so do you segregate that up and drop from that police services fund? It's right on my way home. Do my loop. I have home. But what if you interrupted an incident, so then then it would be a call that was happening outside the village districts for that fund purposes or not. That was the original meaning of the fund when we voted yeah. it in. Yeah. Was that, though it was on the general But that's fund, your it was, answer. It was already, already understood that, you know, except for some, I've said before, 65% of that comes from the taxpayers outside the district. Originally that fund was set up to be like, Twenty thousand dollars, and they hardly use like four thousand dollars a year out of it for a couple of years. However, there, there may be more need today, and maybe that sixty-five thousand dollars is, is what's palatably needed right now for the coverage that, that Scott does use outside the district. Like, if you're stopping in and having to check on something up there, I would expect that you're being paid for it. You, you, you know what I mean? In, in, in some manner, or it's at least charged against that fund because it is a service that helps that, that, that it helps outside that district. Um, Scott, what about East Valley Academy? Is that ever anything that you're called into at all, or public speaking, or anything like that? Mark, I would. I haven't been out there yet this year. Um, in the past, we've had out-of-control juveniles kind of things, but 
they really do a really, really good job at being able to manage. Um, there's only been a very small handful of any kind of law enforcement response out there in East Valley. And the BSP usually gets called out, but we're, we're quicker and yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll go accordingly. Yeah. We've done that when we were the, with the Sheriff's Office. But yeah, Sheriff's Office is always over that way. Not always, but mm -hmm. it's right near. Mm -hmm. Because so. yeah, logistically, it yeah. would be a lot quicker for you to go to East Randolph or somewhere than it would be for the state sure. police. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you see the state police coming through town a bit? Mm -hmm. I happened to notice yesterday I was coming down to you know, 166 and they were parked right there you know, by the Catholic Church and just kind of watching things for a long time. So. you got a couple of dedicated they live. troopers mm -hmm. that are looking for certain individuals. Yeah, like one of the next to me, and there's, there's, there's a few that actually kind of yeah. live up there in the well, center. Well, a few days there was a whole lot of cars pulled over in Randolph. So. Oh, sure. <laughs> they were all black pickups. Huh. Hmm. I might have had a son that got pulled over, but he wasn't who they were looking for. <laughs> well, they were looking for somebody in a black pickup? Yeah. <laughs> Is it dark blue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So All right. Maybe on the patrol, I mean, something we haven't really touched on yet is patrol versus response. I don't know, not to put you on the spot, but what's a general sort of patrol protocol for a district district based based service? So, I mean, you're going to hit the hot spots. You're going to hit Ridge Road, you're going to hit 66, you're going to hit Route 14, um, and anywhere that we have, you know, any kind of complaints. And I'm, I'm dipping into, you know, from what we did in the Sheriff's Office. Um, and, you know, we would get the speed complaints on Grand Road or, or whatever. So let's go out, let's, let's sit on that, and we'll go from there. Or I've got suspicious activity going over the bridge on Heber Hill, um, you know, whatever, then we'll go out and tailor and hit accordingly to kind of tailor those patrols. But inside the district's roughly the same. Inside the district, I mean, inside the village district, you're at a two square mile area, so it's a lot of circles. <laughs> <laughs> That's the shark. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of circles. <laughs> But you know, we, as we brought, if you know, you're to go townwide or ex even expand the district, now you're going into a bigger patrol area where you've got now to maximize instead of small circles, you're maybe making bigger circles, and it's just more of those parts pieces you got to really play with to maximize as much, as much as you can. Well, it always seemed right to me that if you expand the district, you have to think of not just the mileage, but you also have to think of the FTEs involved. You know, you know how much staff do you actually need to cover that? To provide what Trinity says, you're going to go by my house three times a day. Yeah, you know that's that that that's that's that's, that's what, what I look at. I say. would venture to say there isn't a chance the town no. can afford to pay for no, him I to mean, drive I would, by everybody's house the same amount of times. I, I, I would venture to say that's, that, but I would would suggest that if you broaden that base, if you also broaden the tax base, yep. and then if you broaden the tax base, you're going to have to hire at least some of the FDEs to make that plausible. You know. I'm not saying you had to have 20, 20 policemen. No, because you're your 100 goes miles up. versus 20 miles, right. right? You know, but it, but but still to to be responsive to those folks in East Randolph. You know, well, we did this uh, exercise as one of the options when we were looking at it, um, and we came up with what it would cost to have a department similar to what we had. I think is what we did. Um, and if it was to expand out, and what that would, what the impact would be on the taxes, and it just even what we did for that model wasn't the staffing that would be needed. Like, we knew that that budget was low, extremely low for what was going to be needed. But all right, we're headed off down a rabbit hole here. Um, so we had our conversations. We have a list of next time. If they want to come, yeah. Um, so the benchmarking exercise. Just to give you an update, we're working through this. It's been a little slower than I would like, just because we've got a few different things going on here. I did want to give you, show you sort of what we have added. We've started to populate in um, some of the budget-related data, and so we're at the tax rate. One of the things we are 
discovering, which is not a surprise, is um, there isn't any uniform way of essentially accounting for or presenting what goes into your police budget. So some of these are, um, you may have different parts and pieces and we'll want to verify with the town directly. So when you look at Manchester's, the way they break out their costs, um, they have police operating and then all of their personnel costs are in a single bucket. So you have to go in and pick out through the categories for, you know, chief salary, administration officers, all of those pieces, and then and put those numbers together. Whereas when you look at, say, a, a Heinsberg model, that's more similar to what we're doing, that it's all in one consistent sort of police account. So we'll sort out some of those nuances. Some of the ones that are highlighted are the ones that I'm having a hard time locating. Um, village specific data and they're where the village police department is the primary or some other district so the Woodstock number is the one at the very bottom we know there's roughly a 60 40 split that's the town portion only um, so I'll have to go directly to some of those folks and collecting tax rate data I want to do just the police tax rate see as a percent of the overall one of the things we're finding though is again that's something we break out others break out um, we may have to do some additional math on those pieces to make an apples to apples comparison. I've added in some per capita statistics for law enforcement full-time, full-time PDs, because some folks have dispatch capacity, some have other administrative capacity, and then part-time officers. Part of the reason for the per capita one is that when you look at the employee counts, um, trying to get all of the categories in a way that is a little more coherent can be tough when everybody's broken out by rank in different cases. We rely pretty heavily on some VLCT data. Some of this we have to fill out. Bristol has more than one officer, for example. Um, but it's the only one we can verify. Same thing with Heinsberg we have, I think it's closer to five. Um, but we've filled in what we can, done the same thing with some of the averages, and we'll fill this up. Part-time officers are in here. Again, where some of the follow-up has to go. Scott and I were talking about this. I don't really believe that Manchester, Vermont has 16 part-time police officers or something in that <laughs> count that we don't understand. Maybe they do. That's a, an unusual thing to happen. We were wondering if there's some bleed over with firefighter rosters and lower levels of certification as a way to augment when you can see that most of the part-time officer counts are landing in similar spots. Um, and then so we've tried to break it out. Dispatchers where administrative support. And then I've kept some notes in here where we know that there might be some dual duties listed here. So one of the stow officers is also listed as the tech officer. Um, so that's that's a model I've seen in a bigger town police department budget where you might have an officer assigned and you might be a lieutenant who's kind of the tech line and does everything from radios to the mobile data units. And then the full time LEOs, full time employees uh, and so we've added all of those pieces since we last looked at this. So we're building it out, but I'm going to have to go into more of a survey mode than I'd hoped. And so it's just building those individual to pick into some of the town's stuff. Um, so we're making progress. It's just a little bogged down. Um, we've added in pieces we can add in. If, if you're not able to get all of the towns, it would seem as though we, it would still give us plenty to work with. Yeah, and we'll know exactly where, if there's an issue with the data, or there's some questions or open questions, we'll always try to keep track of those. Um, but you do get a pretty good representative sample of when we knew we had a foundational budget. Um, and the grand list is the number of people in registered? or No, grand list the is the property. It's 1% of all the property value in town. So this is what the property taxes are based off of. So oh, when we I charge see. for okay. police services, by and large, we're charging off these numbers. And they're all from the same data set with the exception of ours. And is there... If, we is do have population over here. Okay. There, and we're using that for the per capita statistics and the population density, just so you get a sense of how dense a place is. Yeah. Newport City's only a couple of square miles. Um, and right now we're broken out all just town-wide. Same thing, we'll have to do this with Swanton, Woodstock, BF, and in Morristown to a certain extent. So the short takeaways from the data so far is we have a lot fewer people and a lot less money for what are comparable amounts of road mileage this doesn't put any of the 
crime, you know, response crime, other statistics in there. It just sort of looks at some of those, the things that we can draw apples to apples to, um, to the extent we can. I've tried to do both the averages and the medians, knowing that when you look at Grandma's data, I mean, you can see Stowe's the one you can probably guess that jumps out at you. $24 million. That would be a really nice problem to have, by the way. As opposed to four and a half. Um, do you have the road mileage for all of those places? Yep. We did put that over here, and I've got to follow up with vehicle <coughs> counts. Used to be able to get that out of that data set. So square miles and road miles, so you get a sense of exactly how far, how big the, the, the tank is, um, and how many roads to get there. These are the, you know, there you go, there's Newport City. I had them a little smaller than that, but a lot of, you know, urban village type streets. And this for us is it's just a smaller easy. tank for you to make your circles. Yeah. <laughs> tighter make circles. A sharp circle. So, so we're listed. These are all the local miles. So this doesn't include things like the interstate, state routes. These are all local mile counts. Um, and so right, right. But your budget is based upon not those road miles. Your budget is based upon the 20 road miles in the district. So with, with that, with that right. said, so that skews that number of how much is spending per road mile. Well, it's also we're going to have to break down mm -hmm. an extra layer for a couple of these. But we want both. If you're going to review the different models that are in there, you sort of have to know what does it look like in a whole system. And then also what does it look like in a smaller system. So but there's a sense of of right, right. if we say we end up at a spot where you want to consider something different, well, if we're talking about 48 square miles and 91 road miles, you know, we're getting into some bigger territory here. Um, you can also see from this that the original map makers way back in 17 whatever tried to set them all as even squares and they may have missed. I think that's what I, I was getting at, that <laughs> if you were to cover the whole town, the FDEs required right. would also, as if you take what you're spending now, not that, it, not that it's an economy of scale, it's not at all. You have a lot more crime in the village, and obviously it's not economy of scale. Right, yeah, right, right. but if you're, if you're going by road miles and you have 20 miles versus 90 miles that you're doing, you know, 20 miles, you have four FTEs. Obviously, you're not going to multiply that by four and then add that many FTEs in there, you know, to, 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 get, to get there, yeah, you know. But I, I think um, it is useful know. whether you're talking district or town-wide or something in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to drive at is what's the right number of people because it's not three. Right, right. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, now you love working all the time, but it's not three, probably. <laughs> right. No, I, to I totally agree with what you're saying. Absolutely. So this lets us see in those different models, where does everybody land? And, and they're, I think, landing closer together by and large, with but, some nuances based on what the right. community is. I'm just saying, with, with the, the communities that cover the whole community and their road miles are, say, somewhat similar, 90, 100 miles or whatever, whatever it is, of course, their budget is certainly going to be much larger because they are covering that much, that much more. But you get a Winooski yeah. or a Virgens, and you're not too far off population side on one side or the other, and your your network is compact, mm -hmm. but you might have the higher officer counts. Right. So that's where we've got to add in some of those community right. character factors as well. In right. There right. right. Thank you. Yeah. So we're getting there. Mm -hmm. I would love to spend time on this, but. We've talked dog we've talk dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've had to do a lot of dog stuff. Okay. Dogs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Review data and discuss buckets. So we'll send you the August data again to make sure you've got it. It's all posted. There are two things. This is the first, I don't know if folks want to copy this thing Judy sent around where she pulled some representative samples from the Spillman system that I think it's a trio of PDs used to give you a sense of time for call type. And Scott tried to pull a similar data set today um, just to I give you a sense. So. And just to note sort of the differences with Belcor as we try to drill in a little bit of time. I'm very impressed. So you can see we don't have the same sort of breakdown because with the Belcor system you can track it from dispatch to, you know, on route, on scene, clear that. So it's all based on that dispatch data, but it may not get on to some of the points that we heard earlier for the communication and the after.
could factor into what this total count would be. But it at least gives you a sense of, in real time, if we have a case maybe run a little bit longer, you can see what, what types those might be more often than not, you know, at least from that representative set. <coughs> We've still got to try to map some of the August data and make that a running. Are we able to hire a full-time officer based on fingerprinting yet? <laughs> no, but I'm well, going to. thing, you don't need, need it. I'm going to spend the time this is over. <laughs> oh, that's the running joke. Really oh, about the bet? Yeah. 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 Mm. Really bad wages. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't there a huge legislative increase in, like, Nurses needing to get uh, fingerprinted Nurses, more often. Uh, people that are like uh, chaperoning their kids for school. Yeah. Fingerprinted. Right. There's a, there's a huge yeah. yeah. The loss of depots to go to get it done during because of flood damage too has I think. Oh yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see next year versus this year. Washington County, Montpelier, Berry City. Done. Yeah, right. We, we picked up a lot of that. Yeah. Really. Yeah. But it sounds like Trevor should have done his legislative uh, history lesson before he made the bet, the wage. I learned a valuable, valuable lesson. We had to get a couple of hurry out of it, I'll tell you. Yeah. I also learned, yeah, some valuable lessons about Rose. So. It's going to be like a little banner above the PD. So yeah. Are you doing a lot of things? Here? Spot, yeah, spots are good. If we had the equipment, we don't. I, I bet I get five calls a week. You don't have the equipment. We don't have the equipment. The fingerprints. Yeah, it's a money-making business. Yeah. We charge what? It's the statutory maximum thirty-five per time, and we're over four thousand. Uh, more. Three thousand was last month. We're already up to a grand right now. We broke the grand today. For the most purposes, so we're we're already up almost eight grand. Thirty-five dollars for a fingerprint. Does Rosemary have time to do anything else? I keep her pretty busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> He's proud about that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know where my lines are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Research, follow up, and tasks for our next meeting. We've got some scheduling to do. We'll keep working through our, our homework projects here. We'll get you August data. We won't have September for a couple weeks. But. I'll check your overall work calendar and see if there's anything that I introduced to you that I on schedule. I feel like we're creeping towards actual hard discussions about budget and we're starting to get close. who's Service. paying what, yeah. What, what did you call it? Sir? Service levels, too. Service levels, yeah, yeah. Both from a menu and a level. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, is it oh, like that? I still feel like there's stuff that some of us could be doing to help fill in some of those gaps. I might try to pull off some pieces of that benchmarking study and see if we can share them a little bit. If it's easy yeah. enough I mean, to do it's via email, because some of the stuff might, just to make sure we stay time on task yeah. with it, I, that's the part. It feels like that could bog us down and then we'd miss our target. Yeah. Do you think it would be helpful if we split up the towns and called them directly with a list of questions from you? Uh, I think it's easy enough for me to send them the sort of the budget officer vehicle questions. I can do it all in one and even sort of share the work product so far and how we got it. And because it's going to be valuable to them as well, whether everything from, you know, union negotiations to their own budgeting process to their own. Some of these folks are having similar conversations about levels of service. And so I think we'll be able to draw them out. Some of the ones where I might need some help is if we connect with others and other entities about um, and what other services are embedded or contracted for. Those types of things might be the ones if there's uh, different yeah. community characteristics. Um, yeah, I'm happy to help with the embedded question mm -hmm. yeah. since I'm the one who raised it. But um, uh, I can't. I don't remember all the towns that we hit on there. But I, yeah. I, a lot of it I can just answer. I'm in a, I'm in a room with a lot of those people yeah. often, so okay. it would be easy for me to fill that in. They'll trust you. Trevor, when you're networking with all the other <laughs> yeah, <it's> so <laughs> uh, your managers, are they, like, when you say they're talking about the same things we are, are, like, are they, like, are you kind of brainstorming together and about different things? I mean, you don't have yeah. to share anything, but I'm just, you know, like, just wondering, like, 
I mean, to put you on the spot, but no. what, what, I mean, there's got to be a lot of, I mean, I talk to people all the time about different things, and I know there's a lot of creative thinking going on as far as different services on how to work together, together yeah. as right. a town. Most of, it, yeah. most of it's either just following what's going on, knowing the history, going back to my days at VLCT, mm -hmm. um, having been involved in similar conversations there, so just keeping an eye on it, um, having old contacts, because maybe I worked in one mm -hmm. or more of the places. So it's that. I don't know, um, you know, we don't want to get together and sort of discuss these things. When policing's come up in recent years, it's been the push-pull of how do you staff, um, and then also how do you create, maintain, support an entity when everything about our visions of law enforcement are evolving mm -hmm. from, yeah. you know, in, in every facet, and how do we all work through those challenges when we're probably competing for the same pool that doesn't have enough People. fish in it anyway yeah. in, in a good year in the good, the good old days when employees were at least easier to find. Yeah. Um, well, and on that vein, I, I want to know if we decide as a group that we want to have an embedded person that would be employed by Clara Martin Center, if that's the model in the other counties, I want to know from Clara Martin, can they pay for it? Right. You know, um, or are they looking for a 50-50 or, you know, mm -hmm. where, what, what do they have in their budget for right. this? On Pillar Street out, street outreach workers, I think a 50. I have to check on the percentage, but I think it's a 50-50 split with one of the organizations. Um, well, with Washington County Mental Health, I, that's where I work. But I they, it Washington County, but it's between else. Barry and Montpelier. But they just had to up it yeah. 12 grand a piece, so 24 grand. Yeah. They just upped the salary because they couldn't find anybody to take the job because it was listed at 40, I think, yeah. and nobody wanted to work for 40. Yeah. Um, so now it's up at 64, and they just hired somebody actually yesterday. So, but that is split 50-50 between the towns, and then, I mean, the towns pitched in a certain a, a specific dollar amount, right. and then the mental health agency kicked in kicked the rest. In the other. Yeah. And that's not something that they, I mean, that's, um, it's, it's not going to be a big surprise to Claire Martin if we say, you know, you need to pony up yeah. a certain percentage. So there's one individual working with Montpelier and yeah. Barry? Yeah, so that's, that's so what they've done. who would three, Randolph three. share with? Bethel has said that they Bethel wanted somebody. One. I mean, yeah. if they figured it out, but that is a good question about whether there's already an established um, one. The BSP are having trouble finding somebody in the Railton Fairs yeah. too, yeah. right? So yeah. maybe it's a shared position with them. Could be. Yeah, because that's and pretty they creative when you start doing it like that. Yeah, I mean, it oh, always yeah. sends all the way around. Cause and you see it more wins. and more around the state yeah. sharing those resources. Well, they have vacancy <coughs> savings like crazy in their budget, too. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and that's been useful with one of the ways they've used it. This is my wife works for the city. It's been helpful when they've needed. Um, when there's some, I mean, they have some clear protocols, dispatcher to train, we've talked about those pieces, but it's a nice way to sort of triage what does somebody need for services and when and where do you actually need to send a law enforcement officer versus being able to steer someone into some other sort of channels. And they have seen, at least anecdotally, it feels like some successes with being able to, to create those interfaces and knock down the number of times that, a, that an officer is required. Or at least initially, they have a better sense of when they roll into it. Uh, and that's not just Montpelier and Barry, it's across the state. Yeah. Yeah. Any department that has one wishes they had to because of the cost savings. We're having a lot of interactions with folks who are camping in the yeah. various spots. It seems to be the entry point. You know, mm -hmm. We haven't had that, but that doesn't mean we wouldn't. Uh, I see Stuart Bradford was wrestling with that or something. Somebody. You wouldn't necessarily think just because of travel patterns and... Well, Montpelier has seen a whole influx because people have heard that there are a lot of more services and, and more mm -hmm. warm places to stay in Montpelier, and they're coming in from Burlington to, mm -hmm. to, yeah. Yeah, it's very frustrating for the police department anyway to figure out, like, how are we going to deal with this? Yeah. Yeah. Are well, they realizing the transit center isn't the answer? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's turning into a hot spot. It is. Okay. So anyway, if you want to send that call yeah. on my way, I'm happy to deal okay. with that. I'll try to split those off. And, and, and what can you do? Whatever anybody wants me to do. <laughs> <laughs>
and see which ones make, make sense to split out. I just, I did think that it, you know, it was kind of interesting when I ran these stats because, I mean, granted it's not Randolph PD, but investigating a burglary, whether you're in Norwich, Hartford, Randolph, Bennington, wherever, it's going to take approximately the same length of time. And um, averaging it out over all the calls received, every single call, and it averaged, you know, an hour and a half, and you think, well, that's not long, but then you think, I get four hours, you get four calls a day. Okay, four calls a day, that's not very many. But that's an eight hour shift, yep. four calls times an hour and a half. Um, that's, that's your day. And the majority of this doesn't cover the paperwork because nobody opens the case back up while they're typing the paperwork to add in more time. So, yeah. So. Or, or those communication things that we just heard about. Exactly. You know, like calling for follow up or yeah. checking in, stuff like that. Right. So. Like, um, Kristen, was that her name? Yes. 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 Said she may only talk to the chief for 10 minutes. But how much stuff had he already done before he called her, and how much did he do afterwards? Yeah. But, you, can't, yeah. yeah. you can't make a timeline on it. No. Yeah. Just can't. Also, there's the, there's the part if they, you know, catch what, whoever the perpetrator is and they end up in court, mm -hmm. how much time do they spend sitting in the courthouse? Then you have court time. They, yeah. they, they don't all that. That's. Oh, we don't really try anybody time. here, though. We just let them all go. Don't need that budget line up. So pay the officer to go. All right, have the communications and correspondence. Nothing new to report. Hold all. We've heard nothing from the public. No, but I think once you get closer to the meteor stuff. Yeah, I'm okay. Like, uh, a little more interesting. Aaron's talking about anything to tick him off yet. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the water then, shall we? Is <laughs> uh, something going on about the water? <laughs> Boy, so uh, That's not this committee. <laughs> yes, I'd love to adjourn it. I have a motion to adjourn the second. meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.